today. The Bible reads in John chapter 19, look at about verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hessop and put it to his mouth. Verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Or if another word you'd like to use there, uh, relinquished his spirit. I want to preach a little bit today about it is finished. And I, I'll give you a subtitle today. Uh, it's not over, it's just complete. Yeah. Come on, put your Bibles down, lift your hands and hearts towards heaven. Jesus today. God, anoint us. This is not some leftover sermon, but this is a word for this group of people today that our souls would be fed. God, we would have illumination that there is a spirit world, a heaven to gain, and a hell to shun. Help us today to receive it in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Yeah. Now, why don't you get out of your, your row and begin to greet with them and say, I'm glad you decided to come to the house of the Lord today. Now, after you've been friendly, you can find your seat. Don't just up and leave today. We have a baptism right at the conclusion of the service today. We're excited about what God is doing in people's lives. Amen? Now, we hear this phrase, it is finished. And I'm persuaded to believe that all things from the Greek don't translate fluently or evenly into English, that sometimes things get lost in translation. I'll give you an example that one of our loving Hispanic members here uh, called Pastor their little gordito. And I went, I, I was doing a play stupid, I just acted like I knew what they were, you know, thank you so much. And I got my Spanish to English translation out. And I looked it up, and it translates my little fat pig. I think I'm helping some people today. I didn't know whether to be mad or glad. They just call me a little fat pig. And so I began to express to one of our other uh, bilingual people here, I said, they call me a little fat pig. Is that bad? Oh, no, Pastor, that's a term of endearment. It, it, it's a lo loving phrase. It's an appreciative. I said, hello, I didn't understand it that way. It lost something to me in the translation. So is this phrase, it is finished, from the uh, Hellenistic Greek, the common ordinary uh, Greek of the day translated. Paid in full means paid in full. I mean, excuse me, uh, it is finished means paid in full. And we understand that. That is an accounting term. Anybody here ever bought a new car? And you loved it at first, but by the time you got to the 83rd payment, you'd be glad to drive it off a cliff if it'd make the payments go away. Can I, can I get an amen on that? It started out so well, but after the kids spilled orange drink and ketchup on the seats from Happy Meals, after that baby bottle got left under the seat for two weeks in the summertime. Come on, somebody, help me preach. I would that this car be gone in Jesus' name. And you're still making payments and you're noticing you're making a $350 payment. And, and 320 somethings go going to interest and $17 is going to principal. Anybody can relate to that. It's all going to interest. You ain't getting nowhere. So it is. When he said it is finished, it was an accounting financial term. It means paid in full. Before this point, 
in the Old Testament under the law, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, that they would make animal sacrifice annually. And it didn't pay their sins. It made it basically was an appeasement offering. Anybody here almost had your power turned off? Anybody didn't have the full bill, but they said if you'll pay X amount, we'll leave it on for a week or two so you can make I'm preaching to myself today. You made a minimum payment just to appease the creditor so they wouldn't turn it off or repossess it. In the Old Testament, Brother Randall, they wasn't really paying for their sins. They were just making an interest payment to appease God, looking for a new testament, a new day, a new covenant. It didn't cover their sins. It just paid some interest until the sin debt could be paid. But thanks be to Jesus Christ, uh, who said when he gave himself willingly on a cross, it is finished. He wasn't making an interest payment. Uh, He was making an absolute and full principle payment. He was paying all your sins past, all your sins present, and all your sins future. When he said it is finished, it was just the beginning for me that I was dead in trespasses and sin, but by the blood of Jesus, a new covenant, a new life, a new way to live, I can live forever. That's what I want you to get. It's a misunderstanding when it is finished. I'm persuaded that many people believe his ministry was over. But when he died, he just started living. <laughs> See, when Jesus said it was finished, uh, the best example I can give, and I search for others, but nothing worked as well for me as this one. Anybody been fishing? Brother Matt and I are going to go catching here really soon. We're going to quit fishing, and we're going to start catching. Amen? I think, a, I think a fish needs to bite my hook just that I've been here so long, you owe me. <laughs> I've been feeding you for weeks, and... At least pull on the string every now and again. Have pity on me. Here's what I want you to understand. That my dad would take me at three and four years old and my brother at five and six years old and go down to the riverbank. Can you imagine how tedious and laborious that was to load us up and get all the rods and reels and tackle? Not only, Brother Israel, were we no help, we were a distraction that he couldn't hardly walk. And he's having to make sure we didn't fall in the water or hurt ourselves. And dad would get us down there and he'd put my brother on one side and I was so little and high energy that he would put me right between him. Beside him was not sufficient. He had to put me where he could squeeze me with his kneecap so I wouldn't fall in the water. And I can still see him working 30 minutes, pulling out the string and untangling it and putting the hook just where it needed to go and the weight right where it needed to go. And he put the bobber on the top and he put bait on it. It'd take him 30 minutes to get two lines fixed without us falling in the water. Amen. And after 30 minutes of intense work, he said, it's finished. As a three or four-year-old kid, I thought, well, are we going home? We ain't done nothing yet. No. He wasn't saying, it's over, let's go home. He was saying, now I've got it situated that there is a hope that you might catch a fish. Can I give you a word today? When Jesus said it was finished, it wasn't over, honey. He was just making things accessible. He was setting it up where you could succeed. I want you to know that you can have life and have it more abundantly. For our Father who loves us knows how to work all things together for good, that in the mind of God from the foundations of the world. He saw the cross as a way to make a way where there was no way. Is what I want you to get today. Aren't you glad that we got a father who will fix things? So we misunderstand the word paid in full. But it's not just an accounting term that the balance was paid past, present, future. It is also a covenant term. Now that word covenant, we it loses something in this generation. We we like the words uh contract or agreement. Some of you have an HOA homeowners association, uh an agreement or contract and other uh contracts to purchase a home or a contract for a job. But in biblical times they had a word called covenant and that word covenant literally means to cut. You cannot have a covenant without a cutting. That means there's going to be some blood involved. In the Old Testament or the the Old Covenant, 
what we call the Old Testament is the uh, writings of the law and the prophets. And in that old uh, relationship plan with God, there was blood involved. If you remember when God called his people out of Egypt, which is a type of the world, that they couldn't get out of the world without blood being applied to the door. That an innocent lamb gave his life that they would have blood to apply. And what brought Death and destruction to the Egyptians brought deliverance to those who obeyed God's plan. And the very same night that the blood was applied. Can I tell you, God's blood don't have to have a time release capsule. God's work, blood works instantaneously. When the blood of the Lamb's been applied, I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how big the adversary is. When God's ready to deliver by the blood, He can bring you out the same night. It, You don't have to have a 12-step program or a 10-week home Bible study. When you get the blood applied, he can change you. He can break addictions. He can overcome depression. He can deliver you from evil. Instant. Our God is able by the blood. And then when he got him in the land of promise, he set him up with a temple or a tabernacle, whichever word you want to use. And and. That temple, that worship center had an outer court and it had an inner court and then it had a holy place and it had a most holy place. And only God's manifest presence, the Shekinah presence of God, rested on a wooden box covered with gold. We call it the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And every year the high priest took blood from an innocent lamb and walked in one time a year and he went into that holy of holies and he sprinkled used a little hessop remember in the same text we read in john they used hessop to give him the vinegar in other words they didn't give they didn't give him uh, fermented or a painkiller they gave him vinegar that was an insult to him but that same hessop was a little leafy branch and the high priest would dip it in a bowl of blood and he would sprinkle it on the seat of mercy and it caused god's anger that had been kindled against the unrighteousness to be the interest payment was paid for another year and for hundreds if not thousands of years they applied blood to the mercy seat not to pay their sin debt it only bought them some time until one who was greater than a lamb for Hebrew says, Brother Offered, if the sacrifices of animals would have been a sufficient, there would have been no need for the Messiah to come. But because God loves you so much, he divested himself of all glory and authority, and he robed himself in flesh, and he came of no reputation, and he was born in a manger, and he was led to a cross. He wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the right place at the right time, for it was in the mind of God. God in him to reconcile and deliver you. He was wanting to pay your sin debt, but he also wanted to enter into a covenant. You don't think I know what I'm talking about? I'm telling you, a covenant requires two things. It requires first blood. The Old Testament was a blood of animals. But Jesus, who was the paschal lamb to pay for our sins, past, present, and future, when his blood was poured out, there was a ripping of his flesh. And when that blood began to pour out of him, it covered our sin. I, I, I'm getting bogged what I want to say is, is that we became blood brothers. Our bloods became co-mingled with God. In the Old Testament, it was the blood of animals. But in the New Testament, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. He wants to reconcile us unto himself. Now, let me give you an illustration today. Maybe you've heard of this guy. Maybe you haven't. I, I first learned of him in high school and then in Bible college. A guy named David Livingstone. He had been a doctor. And during the great Welsh revivals that went out through England in the late 1800s, people were vile and disgusting. And out of the midst of a, a corrupt society and, and fake religion, the Anglican church had become ritualism and there was no real manifest presence of God. But out of that, one young lady stood up and said, I believe there's a God. Can I tell you, when just one person has a revelation that there is a God, and she began to pray, and the more she prayed, she had a desire to fast, and the more she prayed and fast, guess what? Revival swept over the land. True stories I've read out of old newspapers, these men that were hardened, hardened miners that would go into the caves and mine uh, coal out that they would cuss their mules. They cussed at everything. They beat their wife. They drank up their, their 
But when this revival swept through this countryside, it so moved the people that men wouldn't cuss any longer. and They wouldn't beat their kids anymore. And God instantaneously delivered them from alcoholism. That they, their mules that pull the carts out of the mine were so used to being commanded by cuss words that God had touched their vocabulary where they didn't cuss anymore. The mules couldn't understand what they were being asked to do. Can I tell you, I believe God can change our vocabulary that the world is scratching their head. They don't understand. David Livingstone, who had a degree, medical degree, was a doctor and had a practice. God so moved on him, he closed down his practice. He said, I believe God is leading me to the nation of Africa. A white dude is called of God to go to Africa. And he sells all that he has and he goes down there. And he says, if I'm going to be successful, I better have the permission of the king. See, Africa didn't have a lot of boundaries, but they had multiple tribes, and they had several chiefs that oversaw those tribes, but those chiefs bowed to one king. That one king was a very powerful man over the whole continent of Africa. And Livingston said, I, if I'm going to be successful evangelizing Africa, I'm going to need the favor of the king. So he submitted himself to that king over the chiefs, over the tribes of Africa, and he requested that he receive favor. He said, I've got a great gift that I could bless all the people of Africa with if I had the king's permission. And he found favor in the sight of that king. And so the king, through an interpreter, let him know that we must have a covenant if you're going to come and be effective in Africa. He said, what does that mean? He said, first, give me your hand. And the king took his hand and took the sword off of his hip and he sliced. How many evangelists are willing to get their wrist sliced to have revival? He sliced his wrist and Livingstone submitted himself and the blood began to pour. And then the king took the sword and put it onto his own wrist. And as the blood began, to, they rubbed their wrist together. They co-mingled the blood. And then a servant of the king gave Livingstone a rag that he wiped up. He, he wiped up and wrapped his wound. And so Livingstone's afraid to ask, but he said, what's next? You said there are two things in a covenant. He said, the first thing now, we're blood brothers. The second thing the second thing is there's got to be a trading of gifts. And the king looked over all of Livingstone's possessions. He had a nice pair of eyeglasses. He, he had uh, binoculars. He, he had maps. Uh, he had some musical equipment. Uh, he had uh, ink pens. He had a lot of neat things. But he said, I want this. And he pointed that Livingstone had a pet goat of everything that the king could have had he wanted his goat has anybody been around a goat a more contrary beast you will not find i didn't say this at nine o'clock my dad got a goat to eat the honeysuckle all that goat had to do was eat honeysuckle all day and drink water and it, it had it made but he was so contrary he had a little chain on him he preferred to jump across a low branch and hang himself as to eat honeysuckle. You will not find a more contrary beast than a goat. But the king said, I want your goat. Livingstone said, here he is. Then all of a sudden the king reached back in, into a satchel that was behind him and he brought out a staff, a wooden staff. And on top of the staff was a knob and on that knob was a carving. It was the king's crest and all that saw it recognized that this was of the king of Africa that all the chiefs answered to and all the tribes bowed. It gave him unlimited access and authority throughout the continent of Africa. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I want you to know that Livingston thanked him for the meeting and he left. Just a few short days later, another tribe that hadn't heard of this meeting found him, white guy in the woods, he stood out. And they drew back their bows, and they were going to execute him on the spot. And Livingston's down on his knees begging for his own life. And then he remembered. He had a staff. And he got the staff out, and he stood it up. And when those who were about to kill him 
Ooh, that's the crest of the king. You don't get that unless you're in fellowship with the king. And then they saw the cut on his wrist. That scar indicates he's in a covenant relationship with the king. We better not touch him. I wish somebody would get a hold of this today. You think your scars identify your problems. I'm telling you, what you've been through is an indication of what God has brought you out of. That you got a crest at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. When we lift up the staff of the cross that bears the name of Jesus. That's covered by his blood. Oh enemy, you have no victory over me. You got to bow at the authority. Because I'm in a covenant relationship with the king of kings and lord of lords. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Greater is he who's in me than he that is in the world. I'm preaching to somebody today. It's not finished. It's not over. It's just complete. God's given you all power and authority. When you come to the cross, what was his death certificate is now your birth certificate. You wasn't living. But when you come unto him, all ye who are weary and heavy laden... He'll not only give you rest, he'll give you a new life and life more abundantly. You just started living when you come before the king in a covenant relationship. On this Easter morning, almost Easter noon, almost Easter lunch, when we think of Jesus on the cross some 2,000 years ago, Sister Josephine, when we hear it is finished, he said, it's not finished. He said, your sin debt's paid. You've been making interest payments, but I just paid off your principal. Paid in full. You could never run up a balance to run it in the red because he's deposited so much to your name. You can't ever be overdrawn. You can't. You. You can't overdraw the grace of God for those who confess their sins. He is sure and just to forgive them and cleanse them of all unright. You can't be overdrawn in Jesus Christ. You can't go so far, do so much that God can't reach you, forgive you, and save you even from yourself. Here's what I want to say today. The cutting, the covenant cutting, was Jesus being nailed to the cross. Then we get a gift. Remember two parts of a covenant first. It's the cutting, the bleeding. God's not going to hurt you. It's only when we die to ourselves, we choose to decrease that he might increase in us. After we allow our blood to be commingled, I'm I'm just going to preach this without fear today. The thing about the blood is it tells a whole lot about you. It tells your DNA It also tells your ancestry. Oh, I feel it. It tells some things you've been involved in that you might have shouldn't have been involved in. Some of us are afraid to get any blood work because it might tell too much. But I'm telling you what, his blood is more powerful than your blood. That when it's commingled, its structure begins to change. You had a DNA that was only carnal. But when you're born again by the Spirit and the blood of God's commingled with your blood, you're no longer got the same ancestor. You got one God above all, through all, and in you all. I don't care where you've been. I don't care where you where you come from the bad side of the tracks. I don't care about your ancestry. I'm telling you, you got a new ancestry in Jesus Christ. I, I never thought the nine o'clock group would be more excited about it than you are. Y'all have had time for more coffee. Luke 22 tells us Jesus holds up the cup. And it's got the fruit of the vine in it. But he says, this represents my blood that was shed for you. It is the New Testament. He's saying, I'm about to strike a new covenant with you. What the old covenant wasn't able to do, the new covenant's going to be able to do. For no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That at the name of Jesus, all power and authority has been granted to you. You can succeed no matter what you're going through. This should excite you today. Did you know Jesus only borrowed a grave, but he purchased the church. 
with his own blood. Do you know why? He was just going to bar a grave because he wasn't going to be dead long. But he wants the church to go on eternally because he wants to live in you forevermore. He don't want to dwell in a tomb made by human hands. He wants to dwell in human beings forevermore. Let me begin to wrap this up today. The only other passage in Scripture that relates to the same word covenant found in It Is Finished that we read in John's Gospel tonight is a story of a young man named Jonathan. His dad is the current king of Israel. Maybe you remember Saul. Saul had disobeyed and God had become, uh, begun to rebuke or resist his service, but he sent Samuel out to anoint a new king. His name was David, and David served everywhere he could the best he could, as much as Saul would let him, but he, even though Saul was in a fallen state, David still respected the position he was in. But something about Jonathan and David clicked. Do you understand in the vision of men that Jonathan was going to be the next king of Israel? If there was stock to be sold, somebody had already purchased the domain name Jonathan.King.com. I promise you, they perceived he was going to be the next king of Israel. But God, Sister Sherry, had another plan. And God anointed David because he was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't after a position. He was after the God who gives the position. And David continued to be respectful of Saul, his father, but continued to worship God with reckless unabashed. He didn't care. He just served God to the best of his ability. And David and Jonathan became friends. Here's Jonathan, heir apparent to the throne, but he saw the anointing of God in David. So in 1 Samuel 19, it talks about that Jonathan loved David so much and respected the anointing that was in his life. The Bible says they entered into a covenant. Jonathan says, I know in the eyes of men, I'm going to be the next king of Israel. But I see God working in you and through you. And I'm not going to propel myself to be king when I know God wants you to be king. And the Bible says they entered into a covenant. That means there was a cutting. They became blood brothers. That means they had an oath, an allegiance one to another to be obedient and faithful. And after that covenant, the Bible says that Jonathan gave David three things. Number one, he he put on his robe. Everybody say robe. His robe identified his royal position that from a long ways off, they could see that purple robe and know, here comes royalty. Oh, that is Jonathan, the king's son, the next king of Israel. But he gave it to David. He says, you wear this. The Bible says that the people accepted David. In other words, he had the favor of Jonathan and the people followed David also. And then he gave him his uh, garments, his outer clothes that were under his priestly robe or his royal robe. And those garments uh, relate to the provisions of God. God knows what you need. Jesus could have come as a sinless lamb and died on the cross as a baby and paid for our sins. But Jesus wants to do a whole lot more than just cover your sin. Jesus wants you to have life and have it more abundantly. By his stripes you are healed. He don't want to just be your your Savior, he wants to be your healer. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your way maker. He wants to be your confidant. He he wants to be your doctor in a sick room. He wants to be the lawyer in the courtroom. Come on. He wants to be all in all. And then he gave him his sword, the anointed power of authority. And David took these things. And there was a new covenant. Can I say today, Jesus Christ was the prince sent from God to make us joint heirs in the new covenant. The Bible tells us to put on Christ as a garment. Brother David, I know who I am, and I know what I am, and I know what I'm not. And anybody besides me feel unworthy? But Jesus says we have his permission to put on his robe of a. I don't think you're getting that. We, we, don't, we don't have to be a doormat. God's given us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a particular peculiar people. I'm telling you, God wants us to be robed in righteousness. He wants to be clothed with authority, and he wants to give us the sword of the Spirit. I'm skipping a bunch of stuff for the sake of time today. I'm almost done. Once David becomes king and he's living in the palace, I don't know exactly how long. I envision a year or two after his covenant with Jonathan. Jonathan's now dead. Saul's now dead. David's been ushered in as the king. Brings them into the golden age of all of Israel's history. 
And here's David sitting in the palace, possibly on his throne, looking out the window, and he begins to ponder. Sister Dolores, I don't know if he saw that scar that was on his wrist where he had a covenant with, with Jonathan, but he began to ask his servants. He says, are there any heirs? Are there any those that could have inherited Jonathan's legacy still alive? And the servant says, well, it's a sad case. There was one boy. He was just a lad. His name is Mephibosheth, and his nurse was so afraid, she ran when she heard Jonathan and Saul were dead, and she fell, and it, it messed his spine up, and he can't walk, and he just crawls in a hut out at Lodabar. He's isolated and alone. Can you imagine in their culture, if you had any claim to the throne, the new king would have all the relatives killed so nobody would oppose him being king. Can you imagine what Mephibosheth has been told? Hide from the king. He wants to kill you. He's awful, man. He, he hates you. Now, I want you to know there's many people that miss out with the king of kings and lord of lords because they keep listening to what other people say he's like. But the Bible says that the king finds where he's at in Lodabar, and he sends a royal chariot, and they go and pick him up. And the servants get him. They load him in the chariot, and they take him back to the palace, and they carry him in the palace and said, hey, we've got a hot bath drawn for you. We're going to take you and get you cleaned up. Hey, we've got Gucci and Armani clothes for you. You pick a brand. I don't care what brand. You, know, you might be Izod. You might be Polo. Might be Chanel number five. I don't know. You're one of them. He said, the king's got you a whole wardrobe picked out. And when you're dressed, let us know. We're going to bring you down to the presidential ballroom. And we got a table that's 100 feet long. It's got 75 chairs on one side and 75 chairs on the other. But you're going to be set right next to the king. I imagine that began to affect Mephibosheth's thoughts about who David was. He thought he's going to kill me, just eliminate me, just assassinate me. But he's brought me in, and he's given me new clothes to wear. He's given me a nice room to stay in. He, I'm sitting at the king's table, and I'm not just down here at the kitty table. I'm sitting right next to the king of all of Israel. And as he rolled up to the table, son, I'm so glad to have you here. I was best friends with your dad. Do you know why Mephibosheth got an invite to the palace? Not because of who he was. It's because his dad had entered into a covenant relation. I'm telling you today, we got somebody that died on the cross. He shed his blood, and now he's given gifts to men. I'm telling you, because of what Jesus did, we now have somebody to intercede on our behalf because Jesus fulfilled the covenant of the blood and the gift. We now can come boldly before the throne of grace. I don't care how bad off you are or where you've been. It's not, you might be lame, you might be be dirty. You may be of the wrong family, but the king says, is there an heir that has a covenant? Come on, stand to your feet. I could preach some more, but I think it's time to quit. I'm speaking to some people today. You might be lame. You might be affected by sin, but there's a king that has a covenant for you. Yeah. Psalms 25 and 14 says, the Lord is a friend to them that respect him. He teaches them his covenant. A lot of people are afraid of church. A lot of people are afraid to read their Bible. A lot of people are afraid to pray. They're afraid they may hear God. Many people don't try to serve God because they feel like they, they're going to fail and they don't want to let anybody down, including God. Today, it's never been about you. It's all about Him. He's already covered your sins, past, present, and future. Guess what? While we were yet sinners, He knew who you were when He died for you. And He loves you anyway. But those who show respect to Him are the ones He teaches. He unlocks the mysteries of His covenant. Well, preacher, I've never heard anything like this. When you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. When you seek him, you will find him. When you knock, he'll open it. 
If you want to keep going through life and load a bar, crawling around in the dirt, scavenging for food, being afraid, you have free will. You can do that. But if you want to come into the king's house and know he has a table prepared before you in the presence of your enemy. Jeremiah said it best, thinking of the mind of God. He said, I know the plans I have for you to bless you, to prosper you. God's not trying to kill you. He already died for you. The blood's already been offered. But just like dad fixing the rod and reel, if I don't ever cast it, what's my hope of catching anything? Jesus set it all up on the cross. But if we don't complete the covenant by accepting his gift, the covenant's not intact. As Sister Beth plays today, I know this are steps, I know this is are rugs, but we call this the altar area. But I'm, I'm going to ask you today, if you have a desire, you may not recognize it yet, but there'll come a day you'll recognize it. You're one-third part flesh. You got physical problems, you know it, you recognize it. You're one-third part emotion. If you have emotional problems, you'll recognize it. But every one of us are one-third part spirit. And many people neglect their spirit being. I'm here today to tell you Jesus has already set everything up where all you have to do is accept the gift of the covenant relationship and allow him to complete it in you. And Sister Beth plays, I wish today that you would push out of your comfort zone and not think about where I'm going to be this afternoon, but where am I going to be in eternity? And she begins to sing, I'm asking you, Today, this altar is open if you want to be ushered into the presence of the King of kings and Lord of lords. If you want to have authority in circumstances, you want to have your joy be full and the fullness of life. Would you come and pray today?